I am here with Richard Stallman, who's a software developer and software freedom activist. Uh, Richard has a bachelor's from Harvard and was a graduate student in physics at MIT. In 1983, Stallman announced the project to develop the GNU operating system, a Unix-like operating system meant to be entirely free software, and has been the project's leader ever since. With that announcement, he also launched the free software movement. In 1985, he started the Free Software Foundation, of which he's president and full-time volunteer. Stallman has spent most of his time in political advo advocacy for free software and spending uh, and spreading, sorry, the ethical ideas of the movement, as well as campaigning against both software patents and dangerous extension of copyright laws. Stallman officially is a visiting scientist at MIT. It's so nice to have you here, Richard. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to leave off the how are you doing part <laughs> after our conversation I prior. So. <laughs> and you are actually uh, quite an entertaining guy. I was watching some of your um, previous interviews and I, I think, uh, you know, you talk, probably talk a lot to groups that are very tech savvy. And a lot of the people listening to this show are leaders and speakers and it's a kind of a different uh, eclectic crowd. So there may be some people here who aren't as familiar with GNU, Linux, and what the relationship is or isn't between them. Can you kind of give a background of that? Because that's a big part of you know, what people want to hear from you. I think in order for people to think about the secondary points, they need to understand the basic issue here, which is, do you control the software that's doing your computing, or does it control you? Because it's always one or the other, and that's the crucial question about software. <clears throat> when users control the programs they use, we call that free software. Free is in freedom. We're not talking about price. Uh, that's a side issue, which I don't think is terribly important. Uh, it's a it's a detail but whether the software respects your freedom including your freedom to cooperate with other users that is tremendously important so free software is software that respects users freedom and community and in order for it to do that the users have to have control over the program and practically speaking, that means the users have to have four essential freedoms. Concretely, that's the criterion for free software. And, and those uh, freedoms it are? It might be enough. Well, it, okay, freedom zero is to run the program any way you wish for any purpose. Freedom one is the freedom to study the program's source code and change it so it does your computing activities the way you want it to. Freedom two is the freedom to make exact copies and give or sell them to others when you wish. And freedom three, excuse me, freedom three is the freedom to make copies of your modified versions if you've made any, and give or sell them to others when you wish. So the first two fr freedoms, freedom zero and one, give each user separately control over that program. Because when you're free to change the source code and use it, then you can make it do anything at all if you know how. If you have programming skill either personally or in your organization when the user's an organization and that's essential but it's not enough because lots of users are not programmers they do other things mm -hmm. so how do they get to have control of what the program does that happens through collective control meaning that users are free to work together to exercise control over what the program does so these users, who could be individuals or organizations or some of each, they're free to cooperate to change the program. And this doesn't have to be a formally uh, constituted group. Whatever users choose to cooperate, well, okay, they're a group. And they discuss, I suppose, more or less, what changes they want. And then some of those users 
the ones that know how to program, they implement the desired changes. And then they all get to use that version if they like it, and they can also distribute copies of that version to anyone else. So this way, if you don't know how to program or your organization has no programmers, well, you can still participate in a group that will change the program to make it do what those in the group would prefer. Well, okay, so in this process, you've created this GNU. First of all, let's just start with the basics. What's GNU and what is Linux? Can you just... GNU is not Unix. Right. And Basically, that question, what's GNU, uh -huh. has had an amusing answer since the very beginning. <laughs> the right. name is a joke. It's a recursive acronym. GNU stands for GNU is not Unix. Mm -hmm. but what That's it funny. means is GNU is an operating system which it technically and practically resembles Unix. It was intended to to be usable with the same sorts of commands mm -hmm. as the Unix system, because Unix was a pretty good system and it was widely used. But the important thing about GNU is it's all free software. And thus, when the users are running the GNU system, they have control over their computers and control over their computing. You see, if a program doesn't come with the four essential freedoms, that means it controls the users and the developer controls it. So every non-free program gives that you use gives somebody power over you. Whoever owns or develops that program controls the program, and the program controls you. What I recognized was this is a bad way to live. Nowadays, I'd say it generates a system of unjust power, power for the program's developer over the program's users, and nobody should have that kind of power over anyone else. If somebody has that kind of power over you, that somebody is going to shaft you over and over. That's an interesting point because there, you talk. Uh, I've seen so many of your discussions about you know you want to have freedom. You want to have no, you know you don't want them to have the access through uh, you know the backdoor situation where they can change the software or access what you're doing. Um, what do I mean? There's so many people out there that aren't programmers that just want a computer that's functionally appealing and they, they're not concerned if somebody has software that's got digital restrictions or, or anything on them uh, who how do you get through to them this the importance of this freedom <clears throat> and why they need it after i explain the idea of freedom in general so that they can see philosophically why it's an injustice for a program to be non-free then i explain the other injustices that the owners commit intentionally using the power that the non-free software gives them over users. So you have to realize that nowadays the software owners know about the power they're going to have over users if they, make an, if they get somebody to use a non-free program. Uh, they don't have to wake up to this later when they decide to make the program, they probably have a plan involving how they're going to abuse those users with the control over the software that they know they're going to have. And they mistreat the users by putting in malicious functionalities. In other words, they make the programs malware. Let's look at an example that most of your listeners will be familiar with, Microsoft Windows. Okay. What it's non-free software, mm -hmm. so Microsoft controls it and the users don't. What does Microsoft do with that power? Well, it collects personal data. Windows transmits data about the user to Microsoft servers. It has digital restrictions management. In other words, it's designed not to serve the user, but to c stop users from doing what Microsoft doesn't want them to do. And it has a backdoor. 
What don't they want you In to fact, do? In fact, it has several back doors, and uh, one of them is a universal back door. Mm-hmm. Universal means Microsoft can remotely change the software in any way at all, meaning that Microsoft has total power over that computer. Right. And if a computer is running Windows, Microsoft has total power over everything that happens in that computer. It can do anything at all to the user when it, you know, tomorrow, if it decides to do something nasty to your Windows machine, you are at Microsoft's mercy 100%. Now, the universal backdoor was discovered by analyzing uh, reports issued by Windows XP about what it was doing. People deduced that it had a universal backdoor like this. Mm-hmm. Microsoft refused to confirm that, but in Windows Vista, I believe it was, Microsoft announced the presence of a universal backdoor, but it didn't call, it didn't use those words. It had another term that sounded much nicer. It's called auto upgrade, ah. meaning Microsoft can force your computer to install a so-called upgrade, or maybe you'd consider it a downgrade. But whichever one it is, uh-huh. Microsoft can force it in. Um, what are you now, this is the concerned about? Ultimate, the... Well, Microsoft can do any nasty thing. But why would they uh, want to do something nasty? I mean, can you give a little more Because fact they'll on make that? money from it. They'll make money. That's, that's their reason for doing any of these things, generally, is that it's profitable. Mm-hmm. And so... I, I'm not claiming that Microsoft's executives are vicious sadists just looking for a way to screw some helpless users. Mm -hmm. No, they do it if it's profitable. But really, what difference does it make what their motive is? Mm -hmm. The point is, we shouldn't let them be in a position where they can do such things. So, okay, so you you won't use Microsoft. There, there's a laundry list that I've seen on these shows that where you've interviewed where you don't use Airbnb, Amazon, Amtrak, a- Apple, eBooks for different reasons. Eventbrite, Facebook, uh, Evernote, Google. Well, those are not no, no, those are not all similar. Right, right. Those there are many things different I reasons. criticize mm-hmm. about criticize about various companies, mm-hmm. but they're not all concerned with non-free software. Okay. There are other kinds of bad things that a company can do. In the case of Amtrak, for instance, Mm -hmm. it's not about non-free software. It's that Amtrak requires people to show ID to buy a ticket. And you don't want that. And that is an injustice. Do you know what the government they do with should that? not be following people around? I don't know, mm-hmm. but it does. I don't need to know. Mm-hmm. They have no business demanding the information, so uh, we should we should refuse right away at that point. We shouldn't uh, let ourselves get drawn into a discussion of what they would do with the information about us that they shouldn't get in the first place. Mm-hmm. You know that kind of distraction is the sort of thing that leads people to lose their freedom. If somebody starts trying to follow you around, or some agency or organization starts trying to follow you around, it's a mistake to raise the question of what they what they say they will do with the data, mm-hmm. and can you believe they won't change that policy, who knows? But the fact is, because Amtrak exists in the United States, we know one thing that it will do with that data. It will hand that data over to the FBI on request without even a court order, all of it, because that's what the Pat Riot Act requires. Every organization in the U.S. that has data about people is required to hand it over on request without even a court order. Now, I consider this unconstitutional, but worse than that, it's an attack on our human rights. And so we shouldn't ask, well, what will you do with this? We, we know that they will do something unjust with it at any time if they are told to. And we know that we won't find out if they're told to. We, we know they can't tell us if they already have been told to. We have to recognize that just identifying a person is going too far. 
What about post 9-11 now? You know, that you... That changed nothing. It changed nothing, nothing in your mind? Nothing at all, because it was a side issue. Do you feel safe traveling? Underground, it, we've changed the topic, you know. Uh, yeah. We're now talking about uh, whether we should throw away vital human rights mm -hmm. in the name of protecting us. Right. Which is a separate question from mm -hmm. free versus non-free software. I want to point that out. Okay. I think this this issue is very important too. Mm -hmm. But maybe we should stay with the free software issue. Okay. Let, let's go back to that because you you say free uh, software is that's different than open source. Can you explain the difference? Oh well, actually, that's not exactly the way I put it. The idea of free software is fundamentally different from the idea of open source. Okay. But first I should explain what open source means and why it exists. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I started the free software movement in 1983. By 1998, we had the GNU slash Linux operating system and lots of people and companies were using it, so free software was getting some attention and popularity. There were people in the community who didn't want to raise the issue in terms of right and wrong. Mm -hmm. They wanted to forget about that aspect and present it as nothing but another option. And they didn't want to say that it was morally better or anything about morality. They didn't want to talk about justice or injustice or human rights. They just wanted to say, here's something you might like. Okay. And they wanted our ideas of justice to be pushed aside and not discussed anymore. So they coined another term, open source, which hadn't been used before. And uh, that was their opportunity to construct a different discourse based on different values. And it didn't say... Uh, and that anything was wrong. Mm -hmm. It only said, you might find this way of doing things preferable. So where we say, if you develop and release a program, it is morally incumbent on you to respect users' rights to change it and redistribute it. Open source supporters only say, if you develop and release a program, please consider whether it's in your practical interest to let users change and redistribute it. For instance, if you let them, then they might improve the code quality. Mm -hmm. So that's that might be a valid argument, but it's a much shallower argument. It's not based on deep values. And as a result, it, it isn't going to stand up very strong and support strong conclusions. That's, it's interesting because I teach a lot of courses that are ethics-based, and since ethics is subjective, how, you, you're saying this is values-based. Whose values are you using for this? Well, you will judge based on your values, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But uh, I, can't, I can't make an absolute moral statement. Uh -huh. That doesn't mean I'm going to limit myself to saying, well, my opinion is, because that's sort of soft. Mm -hmm. And if you see, say, uh, <clears throat> somebody, uh, say, uh, threatening to start a war between the U.S. and Iran, uh, you don't have to say, well, in my opinion, starting that war would be... Uh, unfortunate. Mm -hmm. You can say something a lot stronger than that. You can say it's wrong. And of course, you're saying it based on your values. But those values are probably shared with lots of people. Well, In fact, the values that free software, that the free software movement is based on, are shared by lots of people. It's just that they haven't seen that there's an issue in the software field which uh, activates those values. They are not accustomed to looking at software in that way mm -hmm. because that's not their habit. You know, right. they haven't been taught to do so. Uh -huh. And, of course, when you look at what the media normally say, they don't say, think about whether your software treats you ethically. Mm -hmm. They're... 
encouraging yeah. people to ignore those kinds of questions. And when everyone around you, it seems, or almost everyone, is encouraging you to discuss what's convenient or inconvenient about a certain program, mm -hmm. things like what is it cost, uh, is it reliable, is it fast, is, is the interface convenient, uh, and not talking about does it respect your freedom, so can you trust it, then most people will follow what the other people around them are saying. So how do we change that? Well, I change that by talking to people about these ethical issues, showing them that the ethical issues are there, mm -hmm. and then they're going to think whatever they think. Right. I can't flip a switch and change what they think, but I can show them a reason to think something different. Well, how much of an impact has your organization made on, you know, of people buying computers well, without you know, proprietary software and that type of thing? It's substantial, mm -hmm. but it's a small fraction of the public. If you look at it, what I think is that if you look at this on a logarithmic scale, we've gone about halfway. Okay. And what's... So what? clearly what we've achieved is pretty big mm -hmm. with the tens of thousands of useful free programs we've got. Mm -hmm. With the work people have done to make it possible to run many different computers without any non-free software, uh, there are many fields which you can now do with only free software. So we've done an awful lot. And yet, clearly, most people are still using non-free software, which is a shame. Uh, now, where would someone even go to buy a, a computer that has no proprietary software? Well, you software? would generally buy it in a store. Mm -hmm. what you'd pro there are companies you can order one from. Mm -hmm. If you look at fsf.org, mm -hmm. that's FSF for Free Software Foundation, fsf.org slash resources slash HW, you'll see the Respect Your Freedom certification we have, mm -hmm. and we've certified various products, including some computers. We're not only the whole operating system, including the drivers, is free, but also the initialization software is free. How much um, functionality are you giving up to have that? And uh, I'm just curious, how cost-wise. There's no answer to that because mm -hmm. you're asking for a sort of overall answer yeah. and there, it's not an tough. overall question. It's only specifics. Mm -hmm. I understand. So in any given area, uh, well, how good is the free software in that area? In some, it's great. Mm -hmm. If what you want to do is make a website, it, the free software is great. Mm -hmm. A lot of important developments were made in free software. Uh, a lot of the platforms everyone uses are free software. Uh, you can do that just great. If what you want to do is CAD, then we're lagging, but we now have something. If what you want to do is animated video, well, it's now getting to be pretty good. And I saw uh, a few months ago somebody made a live-action movie with actors Oh, and yeah. edited huh. it with free software. And somebody's just agreed to develop a directory in GNU.org about how to make, uh, elect how to compose and make electronic music in free software. And, you know, uh, lots and lots of fields are now supported by free software. But in any given area, there might be some features that we don't have. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be really finicky, You'll find some features we don't have, and you can convince yourself that means you have to run the uh, most popular non-free program. Okay. On the other hand, if what you value is freedom strongly, if you're willing to make these small sacrifices for your freedom, then you'll be able to get along okay. And, of course, whether people keep their freedom or not, is mainly down to whether they're willing to make a sacrifice for it from time to time. Well, you know, I'm, I'm interested in the background of where you, how you got to this point. What, what got you so interested in the freedom of, you know, that we were losing? Or the, and and where, what was your background before creating GNU? Oh, 
Well, during the 1970s, I worked at the Artificial Intelligence Lab at MIT. My job was system hacker, meaning that <laughs> I would think of features to add to the system and add them and also fix bugs. Mm -hmm. I was doing this for the users at the AI lab and also the users at another sort of related lab, the lab for computer science. Today, those two labs have merged. It's called CSAIL. Mm -hmm. But at, during the 70s, they were separate, but they used the same free software operating system that had been written by the hackers of the lab. Okay. And so when I joined that team, I wasn't there when the system was first started. I think that was 69. I joined in 1971. But my job was to keep on making it better. And uh, I even got an award for some of the things I added to the system. So in that world, basically, you could fix a bug at anything. Anyone was welcome to come fix a bug. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone was welcome to add features. Mostly it was done by a certain group of people who were the hackers that and we all knew each other. Mm -hmm. Some were employees, some were MIT students who just liked to hang around and, and help improve the software because it was so much fun. Yeah. And uh, so uh, that was what taught me to love the freedom of being in a community where we were working together to make things better for everyone. Right. Well, so... And then that community fell apart in the early 80s but it would be too much of a digression to talk about why. Look at the last chapter of the book, Hackers, by Steve Levy, oh, okay. for that information. Hmm. But uh, in any case, the community was gone. It had collapsed. And uh, the computer that our free software had run on had died, and it was... Uh, it, the, it, that model was getting obsolete anyway. Mm -hmm. For modern computers, there was no free software. Right. And I was faced with the loss of everything I loved. Oh. And I had to choose what kind of future I would have. The easy road would have been to accept proprietary software and probably be paid to develop more proprietary software, and I would have been... I would have hated my life and felt ashamed of it well, that's for the interesting. rest of my life. Now, money obviously doesn't motivate you. and No. Money can't make up for the things I really want. And that is freedom. Which, Well, freedom, but more generally, feeling good about what I am doing. Mm -hmm. Feeling that what I'm doing is something I can be proud of something that should be done rather than something that shouldn't be done. I'd be ashamed of that. Well, where did you get this ethical responsibility training? And, you know, I mean, was this something your family was big on? No. Well, not directly, of mm -hmm. course. When mm -hmm. I was growing up, my parents, my parents probably never saw a computer back then. Yeah. There weren't that many computers around in the 1960s. Uh -huh. I eventually did get to see a computer uh, it, in an IBM lab that let me hang around and write programs. Hmm. But uh, no, my parents, they thought about right and wrong in other areas, but not in this one. Right. I guess they had some influence on me in, in regard to the other, other issues of life. Mm -hmm. But it was comparing myself, what life was like in the AI lab using free software and cooperating with people versus what life was like in other places that used computers with proprietary software and kept saying, I, we refuse to cooperate with you. I see. So, the, well, this... And then, though, I had an experience where I wanted to add a feature. There was, a, there was some software we were using which was not free. It was the software to control a Xerox laser printer hmm. that Xerox gave MIT. Uh, Xerox gave a few of these out to various universities. Mm -hmm. It was the first time anyone outside Xerox got to have a laser printer. And it was a, a very nice printer, but got a lot of paper jams. 
and was jammed <laughs> a lot of the there. time. Yeah. Uh-huh. And uh, it was controlled by a special computer also made by Xerox running entirely proprietary software. Hmm. I wanted to write something so that when the printer got jammed, it would inform the operating system on our, it, it would inform the time-sharing system on our main computer, which was free software, mm-hmm. and then I would make that inform all the users that were waiting for a printout, the printer's jam, go fix it. Ah, cool. I had already done this for our old slow printer that, well, was like a laser printer but didn't have a laser. Uh, but anyway, this feature I knew was very effective in getting people to fix the printer as soon as it jammed. But I couldn't. I was blocked completely from even trying because it was non-free software and we couldn't change it. Xerox had not given us the source code. Mm -hmm. But then I found out somebody had a copy at another university. Mm -hmm. So one day I was there, I went to his office and said, hi, I'm from MIT. Could I have a copy of the printer software source code? And I expected as part of the cooperation of our community that he would give me one. Mm -hmm. But he stunned me by saying, I I promised not to give you a copy. (laughs) And I was was shocked and stunned and disgusted. Mm -hmm. So I turned around silently and walked out of his office. Mm -hmm. I realized that uh, nothing I could say would change his mind. I wasn't willing to give him one more word you know, I was unwill. I shunned him from mm-hmm. that second. But hmm. because this rankled, I kept thinking about it mm-hmm. because I realized he had ref- not just refused to cooperate with me. It was the whole lab at MIT mm-hmm. that he had refused to cooperate with in the ways that were normal in the community. Right. In other words, he had betrayed us, but not just us everyone else too you see he had promised to refuse to cooperate with anyone whatsoever he had signed a non-disclosure agreement Mm -hmm. and what this taught me was non-disclosure agreements have victims they are not uh things that you know are sort of well it's a little bit of annoyance but that's the way it is no you are hurting someone you're doing wrong to people. Non-disclosure hmm. agreements have victims. They are a betrayal. They're wrong. Well, okay. When they concern generally useful technical information, I don't mind if somebody won't tell me uh, who his customers are. Maybe there's even a, an ethical reason not to tell me. Mm-hmm. But in any case, it's not sabotage. Okay. But when you refuse to share generally useful technical information, you are sabotaging society and you're betraying other people that you ought to cooperate with in that way. So then I connected this with a Chinese novel I read. It's an old, famous Chinese novel called The Three Kingdoms. Okay. And it has in it, it's a historical novel with uh, a lot of characters that were real people. And one of them was an evil emperor named Cao Cao, and he said, I'd rather betray the whole world than have the whole world betray me. Okay. Hmm. And I realized that that while Cao Cao only talked about betraying the whole world, that researcher had actually done it. Interesting. Well, okay, so he wouldn't work with MIT. Now, you're you're a visiting scientist at MIT, correct? Still, right. D- now, do no, but that that was in 19, no. that was in 1980 or right. so. Right. I'm curious now. I was I was employed by the MIT AI lab as a system hacker. Right. The point is that the norms of our community said when people wanted some source code, you would give it to them. Right. And, and he refused. Mm-hmm. And he had he made this agreement uh, to get something for himself on the condition of denying it to us. That is betrayal too. 
So I came to the conclusion that a, that a non-disclosure agreement for generally useful technical information is an immoral act. Signing one is an immoral act, and therefore I have never done so to my knowledge. Okay. Well, okay, so now you deal with, uh, in the modern time at MIT, you're dealing with probably uh, a lot of people that are using proprietary software, I would imagine, at MIT. Well, I have, I have nothing to do with their use of proprietary software. Well, I should point out that while I'm a visiting scientist at MIT, uh -huh. my work is not really for MIT. Uh, that's a way of letting me have an office. Ah, what, do you, what kind of work do you do there? Well, I don't do, well, I don't, it's a mistake to associate my work mm -hmm. with MIT. Okay. I have an office. It's nice to have this office here. Mm -hmm. I can borrow books from the library. I, I can see. buy health insurance through MIT. Mm -hmm. uh, but my work is the GNU project and the free software movement and okay. the free software foundation. So uh, I, I talk with people who are running proprietary software. I may not know that they are. Mm -hmm. I don't you know, I don't hate people because they're victims of non-free software. I, mm -hmm. I feel sorry for them. I hope they'll change their minds. I may try to convince them, but I don't, uh, I don't uh, bang on them over and over to get them to change. The point is that I don't participate in supporting or assisting in any way in the use of non-free software. Well, how much of your day does this occupy, your work with GNU.org? Uh, and, and, and I can't estimate it. I mean, it might yeah. be eight or nine hours a day. Uh -huh. The rest of what I do uh, for work is maintaining my personal website, Stallman.org, where I post things, uh, political notes about other issues. Okay, so you're mostly spending most of your time with with the this type of thing in your day i mean you're working on this you've got political interests i, I you, you're a fascinating guy to me I, i'm curious just personally now you know what what interest i mean do you have other hobbies or are you completely focused on on this well i do have some although some of them i can't really do anymore i can't do folk dancing anymore <laughs> because of injuries, yeah. and that made me really oh. sad. Oh. But that's been a long time. It's been almost twenty years that I can't that's dance an anymore. Thing. How'd you get into folk dancing? Well, a group started up in the dorm where uh -huh. I lived, and a friend said you should give it a try. And I thought I wouldn't be able to do it. And the friend said, "Well, until you try it, you don't know." Is that like the and Virginia Reel and that type of thing? Is that are you? Well, those are American folk dances. Uh -huh. but we were doing international folk ah. dances. Oh, well, you, you you have such an interesting. Okay, I'm curious. What other hobbies do you, you're you're interesting to me? Well, because you, you're I don't so do it very much anymore, uh -huh. but I used to play recorder. Okay. What? And I used to play Balinese gamelan music. Okay, MIT I gotta look has that a one Balinese up. gamelan group. Okay. <laughs> and if you've never heard uh -uh. Balinese gamelan music, you should listen to it. I'm going and to. And listen to Javanese gamelan music, too. They're played with basically the same set of instruments, but the style of the music and the spirit is totally different. It's amazing. Well, you... you I, anyway, I never finished. You cut me oh. off when I was trying to explain <laughs> about open source. Okay, let's go back to that, because so I am fascinated. Source, Open source can be understood as a way of co-opting our work and disconnecting it from our ideals. Okay. And it was pretty effective, too, because most of the people in the community at that time, 1998, mm -hmm. agreed with the open source values, not the free software movement's values and political conclusions. Hmm. So... Pretty soon, uh, the main media, including the main tech media, were saying always open source and never free software. And then what happened was uh, that uh, <clears throat> they started describing me as an open source supporter. I see meaning misrepresenting my views. You might as well call, call Bernie Sanders a Republican. <laughs> okay. Well, 
I've seen articles that called me the father of open source. Ah, I won't do that. I sent a letter to the editor saying, <laughs> if I'm the father of open source, it was conceived through artificial insemination <laughs> using stolen sperm without my knowledge or consent. <laughs> And then I present the name and the ideas of the free software movement, which is the serious point right. in the letter. Mm -hmm. But I like starting with a joke. Yeah. <laughs> so the point is, I'm constantly trying to explain to people that, no, open source is not what I stand for. I started this whole thing, and I started it for different reasons earlier, and it's about your freedom. That's mm -hmm. what's important here. Mm -hmm. See, the open source people say that if you make something what we call free software, mm -hmm. it will have practical benefits. And I'm happy if it has practical benefits for you, too, but that's a, a monstrous understatement of what's at stake. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. So I, I guess I have another question on this GNU-Linux combination thing. Now, they talk about... Uh, Linux being um, the the kernel. Can you explain what a kernel is exactly? I mean, you had how in much an, you had done in, in an changes? operating system. Mm -hmm. In an operating system, there is one component called the kernel. Okay, which runs, which it starts the other programs and keeps them separate from each other so they don't uh, get in each other's way, and it allocates the machine's resources mm -hmm. to each of those programs. So the kernel is sort of the lowest level part of the operating system. All the other parts of the operating system are running above that. So it's one of the major essential components of the operating system, and that's the component we didn't have in 1991. Gnu was almost finished, but we didn't have the kernel. Were you we almost started done with writing it? A, well, we started a kernel. Yeah, it was the initial necessary system mm -hmm. was almost finished then. Okay. But what was missing was a kernel. In 1990, we started developing a kernel. Mm -hmm. We hired somebody who was smart to write the kernel for us. Is that Linus? Unfortunately, I chose a design that uh, in hindsight, I would say, was too uh, elegant and advanced and made it a sort of a research project, and it took six years to get a version of it running. Ah, okay. So, But fortunately, we didn't have to wait. Mm -hmm. In 91, Torvalds developed Linux. Right. In 91, Linux was not free software. Mm -hmm. He was using a license that was too restrictive that didn't adequately give people all four freedoms. In 92, he changed to a free software license, okay. specifically the license that I had written, the GNU General Public License, mm -hmm. or GNU GPL for short. So why, why do we hear the word Linux more than GNU? Oh, because people are confused. Okay. Let's Linux straighten was, them out. Cause I in wanna... 1992, Okay. They used other people put GNU together with Linux. Essentially, they used Linux to fill the last gap in the GNU system. Mm -hmm. And the, it was, the result was the combination of GNU and Linux. Mm -hmm. And it was mostly the GNU system, but also had Linux in it. So what do you call that? Well, you ought to call it GNU something or other, because otherwise you're giving no credit to the main developers. But people started calling that combination Linux, which is ambiguous. So the kernel's name is properly Linux. Mm -hmm. And the combination, a lot of people call it Linux also. So when someone says Linux, you can't actually tell what they're talking about. And if they're not wizards, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know that the kernel is just a piece of the whole system that you might install on a computer. So they say Linux for both meetings, and they don't know that they're speaking in a confused way. Mm -hmm. But what you can install on a computer is the GNU slash Linux combination, mm -hmm. which includes Linux, the kernel. I see. And it includes the GNU system. So did you have a relationship with uh, Linus uh, Torvalds, or did, the, did he do this separately from We're you? not friends at all. Okay. I mean, 
He's an open source person. Uh He uh, he doesn't believe in the idea that computer users deserve control over their computing. Mm -hmm. Well, so. uh, how do you make and in, this funded? How do you fund what you're trying to do? I mean, where, where does mostly it from? from individuals' donations. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, that keeps you feeling um, like you're doing you're on the right path, and, and you feel like if you well, do I know I'm things, on the right uh-huh. path. Okay. Well, the only you know, I don't need other people to agree uh-huh. to know that what I'm doing is the right thing because I can see the effects of having or not having freedom. Mm-hmm. And even if nobody else wanted the freedom, I'd still want it for myself. Right. I couldn't advance it as fast right, if right. I were alone. Uh-huh. But, you know, even if you don't want freedom, I still want freedom for me. Mm-hmm. I hope I can help you have freedom, but I can't force you to take it. If you don't want it, you can throw it on the floor, and I can't stop you. I don't try to stop you. Well, you know, it's interesting because I had George Van Hogarden on my show and we were discussing um, what George ha- who? He, he's a deep thinker. Uh, I'll, ha- I'll have to give you his information, but he's uh, very much into disco- uh, that we need to define what freedom is and because it's not really defined in the Constitution. He was going on and on about that. And it was kind of interesting to see his perspective about freedom. And to me, are you as free if you can't use credit cards or you can't drive, go on planes or you don't have I a cell can. phone? Uh-huh. Well, I can. Mm-hmm. I can use credit cards, but since I know that that would result in companies getting information about me that they shouldn't have, mm-hmm. I choose never to use a credit card except to buy airline tickets. Mm-hmm. And the only reason I bought, use them to buy airline tickets is that they demand my ID anyway. Mm -hmm. I would also use the credit card to rent a car, but I basically don't do that anymore. So if some people are getting your credit card information, is that as bad as everybody getting it, or is it okay because it's just some people getting it? I don't want those, I don't want companies to get it. I don't want the credit card companies Mm -hmm. to know what I buy. Mm -hmm. Can you get prepaid? Do you ever do prepaid things? I mean, am I calling? Right now, are we talking on your cell phone so. or somebody else's cell phone? Cause I don't I've... have a cell phone. Yeah. I don't have a cell phone. Okay. I won't carry one uh-huh. because a cell phone does two intolerable things. First of all, it tracks where you are all the time. Mm-hmm. Second, it has a universal back door in the modem processor. That's what connects to the cellular radio network. Mm-hmm. And uh, with that universal back door, they can remotely convert it into a listening device that listens all the time and transmits all the conversations. And you can't stop it by trying to turn it off because there's no real off switch. So I imagine you don't have an, uh, uh, you're not into Alexa at all. So where do you think of that kind of technology? I was once in a house where they had an Alexa device mm-hmm. and I switched it off. Because I don't trust Amazon to not to spy on us. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I, I know that like with Tesla, sometimes they download software to fix certain things within the car. I mean, things are getting to be a lot more connected. Are, are, is it becoming harder for That's you? That's bad. Well, it's bad for a car to be connected. Mm-hmm. A friend of mine bought a Nissan Leaf. Uh-huh. And after I talked with him... I I urged him to check whether it had a cellular modem in it, Mm -hmm. and it did. So he disconnected that. Mm -hmm. That cellular modem would have tracked his car everywhere. And, I mean, is it, why is it so important to you that they don't know where you are? I mean, why does that, why is that so important? When the government knows too much about people, Mm -hmm. it can sabotage dissent Mm-hmm. And it can imprison whistleblowers. Okay. And that is a terrible threat. Now, compared with that, uh, the September 11th attacks in the U.S. were a pinprick. Compared with the Dane, with what can happen if we, uh, you know, as a result of lack of democracy, that's nothing. In fact, 
if you look at what the uh, Republicans in Congress just failed to do, they wanted to take medical insurance away from some uh, 20 to 30 million Americans. How many of them would die next year? Right. You've got to... You've got to arrange these dangers based on how big they are. You've got mm -hmm. to see things in proportion. People have a tendency to overestimate the danger of something spectacular and underestimate the danger of things that are prosaic. So you'll see a lot of people who basically can't think straight once they start thinking about terrorism. Mm -hmm. And they... Uh, they, they go. They basically are, are so terrified, especially because the media harps on it so much, mm -hmm. that they will say, tear up my freedom, take it away, do anything, just keep me safe. And the measures that are taken don't really keep anybody very safe because a, a lot of the things that terrorists can do, there's just no way to predict or stop them. Hmm. Uh, so meanwhile, you look at something like tracking everybody what can a state do if it has tracked everybody put them in prison for their politics infiltrate political dissident groups call them terrorists you know uh, there's there are laws that define some kinds of animal rights protests as terrorism Wow. The definition of terrorism is rather flexible. Mm -hmm. I think the right definition is making war on civilians. Hmm. Uh, that doesn't associate it with any particular motive. Mm -hmm. It gets at the real point. Right. But you'll find lots of other definitions. So I, mean, I don't want to be the victim of a terrorist attack, but I realize that the chances that I would be are tiny, mm -hmm. whereas if we lose our human rights, if the government is too powerful, then uh, we can be crushed by the millions. Mm -hmm. Well, do you think that... So, so I also, I know that if we want to have democracy, which means that the people have control over the state, mm -hmm. then... We need to know what the state is doing. But uh, that's not so easy, especially since a lot of times the state doesn't want us to know what it's doing in our name. So the only way we find out is thanks to a heroic whistleblower. So it's only because of Edward Snowden mm -hmm. that we know how much the U.S. government spies on everybody. In 2012... I was against government surveillance, but I didn't think I was a target of any. Mm -hmm. I was concerned that dissidents would be and so on, mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't per think it had anything to do with me personally. It was mm -hmm. my right. civic concerns mm -hmm. that made me care. Right. But then when Snowden showed us how we're all being spied on, then mm -hmm. I knew I'm being spied on too. So have Just you, like you. Have you talked to him at all about this? I mean, do you go to the uh, White House? Do you talk to... Who are you talking to other than... You well, know? Uh, politicians aren't interested in hearing from me about such things. Why do you think that is? Well, it's, uh, you know, the, uh, the mindset of do anything, take away our freedom, just mm -hmm. protect us. Uh-huh. Uh, is so strong mm -hmm. that hardly any politician dares to question it. Mm -hmm. You know, you could trip. I have a cartoon uh, that was drawn for me by an artist, which contrasts that with Patrick Henry. Okay. Think about mm -hmm. it. I will have liberty or death versus take away my freedom, just keep me safe. Okay, yeah. So which one... Which side do you choose? Especially when you're looking at such a tiny danger. Mm -hmm. You know, when you were talking about rebelling against Great Britain, that you that would put you in real danger. Right. The people who uh, who declared independence for the colonies, mm 
-hmm. They might have been killed for that if they lost. Right. And yet we respond with cowardice to extremely small threats. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, uh, something that kills uh, a handful of people is enough to make most Americans say, take away more of my freedom. Yeah, yeah. Whereas I'd say, we just have to run that small risk because freedom is so important. We've got to fight for it and make sacrifices for it. Well, do you feel like... And that applies to free software, too. Except that in the free software area, the sacrifices we have to make are just convenience. I see. Well, you know, this is so um, fascinating because of the way that technology has changed. Uh, I mean, I worked with... uh, company that worked with IBM in 85 and the system 36 38 so I, I, I'm thinking back in the time of how much has changed just since I've been in here and it, it's almost it, it, if what you're trying to do is it you know get pe- more people to, to know about this is, is does it sometimes feel like you're shoveling water out of the boat with a spoon I mean because there's so much coming in because it's, it's it's advancing so fast there's no use giving up right right if I, I if we gave up, we'd lose the freedom we have won. Mm-hmm. I see. So this when is going to be something is this fight. important, mm-hmm. you just can't give up. Well, I admire you that you uh, you hold, held strong to your beliefs, and I think that there's a lot of people that are going to be interested in finding out more about what you do. And I know we mentioned a couple of your websites early on, but can you just share with everybody how they can find out more? how they can reach you. uh, Could I say a few minutes uh, more of of something else? Sure, go ahead. Um, If somebody had told you in 1990, here's a device that will report to a radio system where you are every few minutes, and that information will be saved for months and will be instantly accessible to government agencies. Mm -hmm. lots of government agencies and it will also it can also be switched on to listen to all the conversation around you all the time and transmit that by radio and then that also can be stocked for (coughs) for a long time Mm -hmm. how would you have reacted in 1990 to that offer I'm sure most people would be surprised and Concerned. Well, they would. Most people would have been disgusted mm-hmm. and said, "What do you take me for? Mm-hmm. Take that horrible thing away." Mm-hmm. Well, that thing is a cellular telephone. Mm-hmm. That's what it does. Most people, however, didn't know it did those things when they were offered it. It was offered to them as a great convenience, and they decided it was one. Mm-hmm. They didn't know that what the price what price they were paying in freedom right and so they got used to it to the point where when if they ever did find out what it really does they said oh oh well, that's unfortunate but i can convince myself not to care very much so that i can go on using it and having the convenience i was just lucky see i'm i'm generally slow to adopt new technology because i'm I've learned to wonder what the price, the unstated price is. Mm -hmm. So by the time I thought of getting a portable phone, which was I think around 2000, I investigated what nasty software functionalities were in it and other problems, and this is what I found out. Uh And I reacted exactly the same way you would have in 1990. I said, this is horrible. What do you take me for? Did you talk to Steve Jobs about this or anybody at the time? No. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I was not particularly friends with Steve Jobs. Uh Well, I didn't loathe him. I Mm -hmm. disapproved of some of what he did, but it was just sort of the ordinary stuff. Mm -hmm. It was later with the iPhone that he started to do something monstrous. And that was imposing censorship on applications. Mm -hmm. That was the pioneering development of the iPhone. Mm -hmm. The users couldn't freely install applications of their choice. They could only install applications approved by Apple. 
Right, right. And since Apple gave itself this censorship power, it is now compelled to use that power uh, for any tyrannical government that makes the demand. So recently, Apple began blocking all VPN applications for users in China. Hmm. China banned VPNs, and China commanded Apple to stop people in China from installing VPN apps. And Apple complied rather than lose all that money. So this demonstrates that we shouldn't allow companies to impose that kind of censorship. It's too dangerous to people's freedom. Well, okay, so we mentioned Microsoft earlier and all the work that, that Bill Gates has done. Uh, it, you say, you know, you can, they still have access to what you don't want them to have access to. Do you, do you think that there's, he has good motives with what he's doing? I mean... I, I, people... People who are doing something that is exploitative mm -hmm. generally find a way to convince themselves that what they're doing is good. Mm -hmm. They may be grasping at straws, but uh, that's basically cognitive dissonance at work. They don't want to recognize that what they're doing is a harmful and wrong thing. So they find some aspect of it that's good for some people, and they present that as their justification. You know, uh, by working as part of the structure, even though it's unjust overall, mm -hmm. uh, I can... Uh, I can shield some people from the potential cruelty that the system would have if not for me. They say that to themselves and they say that to other people. What they don't realize is most of what they're doing is enabling the system to be cruel. Have you ever had a debate with any of these top uh, tech leaders? I mean, I'm curious. No, no, they, I don't think they, I don't think I could, might try, mm -hmm. but I'm not that good at debating. You see, I tend to get frustrated and angry, and then I can't speak very clearly. But there's hmm. no need, really, for me to have a debate, because the ideas I disagree with are so familiar to everyone mm -hmm. that everyone listening to me is going to think of those arguments anyway. No need for someone else to be present to promote them. Mm -hmm. I see what you're saying. Well, I, I think that... Uh you've got some some eye-opening um, things that you, you talk about and I think a lot of people are, have become very used to the devices they've used and I, I, I think it's you, you're gonna have a hard time getting a lot of people to give up what they they feel is convenient mm -hmm. don't you think obviously not in the immediate future mm -hmm. right but uh but you have hope down the road that people will see. Well, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, it's, I don't try to predict mm -hmm. how much success we're going to have mm -hmm. because, first of all, it would, be, uh, it would be silly. So many things happen that I can't anticipate, mm -hmm. that hardly anyone anticipated, that uh, any attempt to forecast would be fatuous. Mm -hmm. And in any case, we've... It's useless to give up. Giving up just guarantees defeat, total defeat. And if we keep on fighting, we'll have an outcome that's better than total defeat. Well, how long have you been fighting this battle now? Uh, I started it, I announced it in 1983. Okay. That's 34 years. Wow, wow. Well, you really um, are an interesting guy to talk to, Richard. I, I could talk to you about this all day because this is fascinating. But as you know, I know you have something to um, to attend to this evening. But I, I really enjoyed um, talking to you. And I think that it would be nice, again, if you could share your um, websites and information. Because unless you had something else you wanted yeah. to add, uh, I think a lot of well, people would no want to know that. Okay. Well, how can they reach you and learn well, more? Well, the GNU system, the GNU project have a website, gnu.org, that's G-N-U dot org. The Free Software Foundation's website is F-S-F dot org. Mm -hmm. And my personal website where I post humor and political articles and daily political notes mm -hmm. is stallman.org. Well, thank you. And uh, 
I really appreciate you being on the show. I, it was nice of you to uh, have this conversation. Oh, and one suggestion to people, uh, if there's some atrocity and television is showing pictures of it over and over, don't look. Don't look. Okay. You can traumatize yourself mm. by seeing such a thing over and over. Hmm. Get your news in print. It gives you a bit of emotional detachment from it, and it protects you from being traumatized by looking at something horrible over and over. Well, thank you for that advice, Richard. And uh, I, I hope everybody takes some time to, to look at your site. And uh, we will be back right after this message.